we're going to go to the book of Jude. Um, it's a little, little one chapter book just before we fall into or come into the revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, Pastor Sexton said it this way. He said, Jude is like a hallway or a vestibule or an entryway that leads us into the revelation of Jesus Christ in the last days. Uh, how many of you believe we're living in the last days? Yes. And uh, Jude was written to those who were living in the last of the last days. It's describing this period of time just before Jesus Christ will return and call his church out and what the days will be like. And, um, and I'm just curious, I asked this yesterday, and I'd ask again today, how many of you um, had the opportunity and the privilege, I would say, to have heard Pastor Sexton speak in person? How many of you in this room have heard, had heard him? Wonderful. I'm glad that you did. Maybe some of you have heard and seen him online or a recording of him speaking. But I'm glad that you had the opportunity uh, to be under his influence in some way. And uh, his influence, the influence of this church, Temple Baptist Church and, and, of course, the Crown College has had a lifelong impact on my, my life and my family. And not just me and my wife and our children, but uh, even as a, as a young, well, an older teenager, but a young Bible college student, our family was, was growing with my, my brother and I came at the same time to Crown College. And uh, as we would come to class and learn things and go home on breaks, we'd talk to our parents about the things we had learned and, and uh, just how to live the Christian life, some of the things that Dr. Sexton was pouring into us. And, and we would share those with our family and our sister. And, and our family was growing through what we were learning here and, and just the impact of that ripple effect on my brother and I as we would go home. So I, I am eternally indebted. Um, to this place and to this school and just the influence of, of Pastor Sexton and, and the ministry here. And, but what they've asked us to do in these sessions, I don't know if you've picked up on this, but they've asked us to take some of the emphasis of Pastor Sexton's ministry, some of the quotes that he had said, and uh, they assigned us or gave us a topic to speak on, and they asked me to speak on Jude verse 3. I want you to see the verses here. We'll begin in verse number 1, and then I'll give you a quote to write down. Everybody have something to write on and write with? Let's look at Jude chapter, excuse me, Jude verse number 1. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. And I want you to take special notice, verse number three. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, that you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Let's have a word of prayer, and then I want you to notice an expression in verse number three. But let's pray. Father, help us today in these next few moments. Lord, I pray that you would... Help us to be exhorted to do what Jude was passionate about here, that we earnestly contend for the faith. Lord, I pray that you'd help these young people, these families, Lord, each of us here today to understand what is upon us, incumbent upon us, the duty that you've been given and, and given to us. Lord, help us to contend for the faith. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Can I draw your attention to an expression in verse number 3? Where Jude says this. I want you to mark it if you'd like to mark in your Bible. He said that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. Earnestly contend for the faith. That is the topic of our, our session today. And I want to give you a quote. Would you write this quote down? This comes from Pastor Clarence Sexton. He said, Our faith was once delivered, but it must be contended for in every generation. Our faith was once delivered, as the Bible tells us. Jude said, our faith, exhort you, I exhort you to contend, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. It was given to us at one point in time, this faith that we hold. But it must be contended for in every generation. In every generation. Our Congress theme this year is what? Say it out loud with me. Continue. Thank you. Yes, to continue. 
And may I say this today, that there is no continuing in the faith unless you are contending for the faith. There's no continuing in it if you're not willing to contend for it. And the only way that you and I have the, even the opportunity today to continue in it is because there have been those before us who contended for it. You understand what I'm saying? We have something handed to us because someone else was willing to fight for it. Someone else was willing to strive for it. Someone else was willing to go forward with it and continue in it so that we could have it to hold. Are you contending for the faith, young person? This is where you and I come into play. This is where you and I, it's our turn, and every generation has the responsibility to do what Jude is saying, and that is to contend, contend, for the faith. I don't know if you know this, but we're in a fight. You're in a fight. As we're sitting in these services, there's a fight that's taking place. As we walk out of these doors and we head out to our lives, tomorrow we'll all head home. Some of you may head home this evening, but as you go back to your home, there's a fight that you're walking into. There's a front that is going to meet you there, and there's a struggle. As you go back to school this fall, there'll be a fight that is facing you. And the Bible tells us that we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Listen, young people, your battle is not another person. Your battle is not with another human being. Some of you think you're fighting your parents. That's not where your struggle is. Some of you think you're battling against peers and people that are pressing against you of your own age. And really, that's not where the battle is. That's not who the battle is with. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a fight, and that fight is against the evil of this world, but it is a fight for the truth. Notice what he says again in verse, tw uh, verse number 3. He says, we are earnestly contending for the faith. What is the faith? What is the faith? You know, the world talks about the faith. Have you ever heard someone, maybe some athlete that says, I just kept the faith. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You hear them speak of the faith. And, well, what is their faith? It makes you wonder. Well, I wonder if this is a, a person of faith. And we even say that phrase, well, they're a person of faith. Well, what does that necessarily mean? And for them, maybe it just means I believed in myself or I believed in the process or I believed in the cause or, or whatever it was. But for a Christian, for a Bible believer, we know that the faith is much more than that. It is much more than me. It's much more than you. It's much more than some process or, or some, some uh, religious thing. The faith that we have, we find it in the Word of God. It is God's Word. But Dr. Sexton said it this way. He said there is an irreducible body of truth. Irreducible body of truth that we hold to. In other words, it can't, can't be broken down any further as you take it to these elemental things, these fundamental truths that we find in the Scriptures. We find those truths, and they are the fundamentals of our faith. You can't take any of them away, or you don't have the faith. The fundamentals of the faith. I'm talking about things like that the Word of God, we believe in the Scriptures, that every word of it is God's Word. This is something to be contended for. This is part of the faith. I'm speaking of salvation by faith through grace, by grace through faith for every man. That Christ died for all men. We believe in the, the, the sufficiency of the cross, of His sacrifice, that He died not just for some, as many may try to tell us, but that He died for all. And that His sacrifice was for all mankind and was sufficient for all. These are parts of, not all of that I'm saying, but these are parts of the faith. We believe in separation. I, I love the emphasis that Pastor Sexton had in the ministry here and, and for the ministry, the philosophy of separation. And it's not just separating from something. You know, anybody can separate from something. It is actually first separating unto. And as we separate ourselves unto the Lord first, unto God first, giving myself unto Him, then there becomes naturally a separation from the world. We believe in these things as a part of the faith. 
believe in a saved church membership, that believers make up a body of, of a group of people that voluntarily join themselves together for one purpose, and that is to carry out the Great Commission. These are things that we learn from Scripture. This is all part of the faith, and there is something that we must contend for, and Jude calls it the faith. The faith. Our faith was once delivered, Pastor Sexton said. We don't need another delivery. We do not need a new faith. We need to contend for the faith that was once delivered. Listen, young people, don't go looking for something new. Don't look for something else than what's been handed to you. I trust and imagine that you come from a church that believes just like is being taught here and preached here. And probably very similar to what our church is teaching and preaching because we believe the Word of God. But listen, what has been taught to you and what you've been handed and what's been fought for in a generation before you and passed to you and now that you hold in your hands to contend for, I would say don't go looking for something new. We don't need a new faith. We don't need some new idea, some new uh, religion, some new way of doing things. We need to contend for the same things. That's what Paul told Timothy. The same commit thou to faithful men. Paul said that the same things are safe things. And so to contend for the faith, I want to give you four things to write down. Four quick, quickly, four things. Number one, May I say this, contending is personal. It is personal. Would you say that with me while you're writing it down? Number one, contending is personal. One more time, contending is personal. I want you to see again in verse number three, as Jude was writing, he said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, I want you to notice the personal pronouns, to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. He says to, to us, he says, Beloved, who is he writing to? He's writing to believers. He's writing to us. He's writing to those who have this faith, those who know the Lord Jesus in their hearts. He's telling us, he said, I was writing unto you to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. You know, if you are a Christian, it is just as important for you to contend for the faith as it is for the pastor of your church to contend for the faith. Do you understand that? You know, we sometimes think, well, the preacher's doing the battle. He's, he's up there leading the thing, and he'll, he'll make sure that the faith gets passed on. He'll make sure that God, you know, God's truth is going to be passed to the others that come after us. But no, it's just as important for you as a believer, to contend for the faith that it is for the pastor of your church, as your parents to contend for the faith, it must become personal. Look what he says in verse number one of this, chat, of this book. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. He says there in verse number three, he calls it those of you of the common salvation. We as believers are a part of a family of faith. If you're saved, you're a part of this family of faith. If you will, we're a part, as Paul would speak of us as soldiers, we're a part of an army of faith. We have this common salvation, and we're all part of this same family. We're part of this same army, and it's our job to take it personal, to contend for the faith. Is it personal to you, this fight? Is it personal for you? Do you know, number one, that you're a part of that family of faith? Do you have that common salvation? Do you know that you're saved? We've heard a lot of preaching this week. And um, I've had some people saved, thank the Lord. Some young people that have come to trust Christ as Savior. And some getting that matter settled once and for all. Is that settled deep in your heart that you know that you're a part of this family of faith? Do you have this common salvation? Has it become personal to you? Do you know Christ? Paul ta talked to Timothy and he, he told him of his faith. He said, I'm so, so thankful for your faith. And he says, I remember your, the unfeigned faith which is in thee. 
unfeigned. You know what that means? It's, it's the idea of not wearing a mask. It's not a fake. It's not some facade that is put on. He said, Peter, or excuse me, he said, Timothy, it is personal to you, this faith that you hold in your heart. He said, it's not a mask. It's not faked. It's not something you're putting on. It's not an act. It's not that you just know how to dress it up and, and put it on and do what you're told and mind your P's and Q's. He said, it is an unfeigned faith. And he says, I see this faith in you. He said, which was first in your grandmother he said and it is also in your mother he said and now it is in you timothy it's personal to you some of you may come from a long line of christian heritage christian family i'm thinking right now of my grandfather who was a first generation christian he came to the lord and because of that he raised his three daughters to know the lord my mother is one of those and because my mother was raised in a Christian home, I had the opportunity to be raised in a Christian home by my parents. And now the Lord's given me an opportunity with my wife to raise our three daughters in a Christian home. But I think of what Paul said to Timothy. It was first with your grandmother and then thy mother. Now I see it in you. Let me ask you, is it personal to you? I'm not talking about your parents' faith. I'm not talking about your grandparents' faith. I'm not speaking of your pastor's faith, but is it personal to you? Do you know that it's your faith? Are you saved, number one? Are you saved? But then are you understanding that you have a personal responsibility to contend for the faith? Is it personal to you? I'm talking about personal. Notice what he says in verse number three. He says, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. He said, I'm exhorting you. I'm trying to get you to understand that it's personal. I'm talking about personal like a Daniel, like a Daniel who said in a, in a wicked place when he was taken from his home, taken out of his spiritual heritage and planted in wicked Babylon under a wicked king. And the Bible says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. It was personal to Daniel. And then when the day came when they told him, you cannot pray to your God, what did Daniel do? Daniel stood before his God on his knees and contended for the faith. Thinking also of those three young men who were there with Daniel. Sh uh, Shananiah... Mishael and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When all were bowing, those three contending for the faith, they stood. And they stood before the king. And they said, Be it known unto thee, O king, we will not bow before thee. But our God is able, they said, to deliver us from the fiery furnace. And they contended for the faith. Why? Why? Because contending is personal, and it was personal to them. I'm thinking of a David, a young David, a young shepherd boy who was not a soldier, but he came to see an army of men who were not contending. They were not willing to get in the fight, and they stood on the sidelines while the enemy mocked God, while the enemy cursed God, and David came onto the scene, and he saw this giant cursing God, and David took it personal. David said, that's my God. You all sing the song, that's my God and I love Him. It's one thing to sing it, it's another thing to be standing in front of the enemy that's mocking your God and say, hey, that's my God. But David stood there with those men and he took it personal. And you know what he said? Is there not a cause? I'll go fight this Philistine. I'll go contend for the faith of our God. And he went out there and slew that man, that Goliath. And he said that all the earth may know. There's a God in Israel. David took it personal. Is it personal to you when your peers will not stand, up, stand for God? When they're standing against your God, will you stand up like a David and say, hey, I want all the earth to know that I have a God. And that's my God. I love Him. Is it personal? Because contending is personal. Let me say this, number two. Contending is passionate. As you're writing it down, say it with me. Contending is passionate. It's passionate. I said this yesterday. I thought about saying contending must be passionate. But as I thought about it, 
I think it's better said that contending is passionate. I think by its very nature, when we talk about getting in a fight, in a struggle, in a strife, it, is, it must be passionate. It's not that you have a choice if you are contending. It is passionate. You don't go to a fight without going with passion. The one that you go to without passion is the fight that you lose. The fight that you lose. We have to do it with passion. Paul, uh, excuse me, Jude, as he was writing, he said, I exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Jude was passionate about telling them that they must be passionate. I appreciate the preaching that we've heard this week. I think of Brother Plowman gets up in the pulpit with passion. He's excited. I, I see him sitting up there on the platform just before he gets to preach. How many of you noticed this? I mean, he gets up on the edge of his seat while they're singing, and he's ready to go. I mean, he's, he's ready to launch out of there like a jet engine. I mean, he's ready to preach. Brother Bell you know, stands up and proclaims, Thus saith the Lord. I appreciate their passion. You know, he said, I got laser focus. I'm here for a laser focus. I'm getting on a jet plane tomorrow. He had a purpose. He had a passion about it. He was here to preach. And God blessed. And thank the Lord for passionate preachers like that. And here Jude was passionately standing before these folks. And he's writing this to them saying, I exhort you to contend for the faith. He was passionate about it. The fight that you go into without passion is the fight that you'll lose. I want you to notice that expression again in verse number three, to earnestly contend. Earnestly contend means to agonize, to strive against opposition. Earnestly contend. It has its root word is the word agonize. It's, it's agony. It's not easy. It, it is work and it takes passion. Some of you are passionate about things that won't matter 40 years from now. 20 years from now, I was passionate. I was passionate about a ball, an orange ball that you throw through an orange hoop with a white net. I see some ballers shaking their head, right? We played basketball in the rain. We played it in the snow. We played it on the dirt. We played, played it in the grass. We played it on wood. We played it on concrete, blacktop, anything you could. If you had a ball and a hoop, we'd play basketball all, all the time. And I loved it. Get passionate about something. And what you do with passion, that's where you invest yourself. And usually if you do it with passion and you invest yourself to it, you come out victorious. That's the goal anyway, right? If you're going to contend for the faith, you've got to do it with passion. With passion. I don't know, sometimes we get up and we cheer and we root and we get passionate about our sports teams. I'm a Mountaineer, West Virginia, let's go. And uh, we, we'll stand up and scream and holler. Don't hate on me, guys. I saw that back there. Hey, we get passionate about what we love. We don't have a, a pro team in West Virginia. We're just a small state, poor state, really. But we get behind our Mountaineers, and we cheer for them. We root for them. And I don't care if you laugh. I'm passionate about it, man. You can laugh. That's all right. Um, but you know what? We get passionate about what we love. Do you love the faith, the faith that you have that's in Christ Jesus? Do you love your Savior enough that you'll be passionate to contend for this faith? Pastor Sexton said the greatest threat to our church, to our faith, is that Christians are silent. It's not what the enemy is doing to the church that is the greatest threat. The greatest threat to the faith is that those who are in the church, those who are of the faith, are silent about the faith. They won't stand up and earnestly contend for the faith. We have a day and age, we live in a day and age where some Christians just exist. This is not a day to exist, this is a day to contend. Let me say number three. Not only is contending personal and contending is passionate, but number three, contending takes preparation it takes preparation would you say that with me contending takes preparation look at verse 20 of this book he says but ye beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith praying in the holy ghost he says beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith 
You see, it is by faith that we come to Christ. And the Lord gives us the faith to trust Him. And as we come to Christ and believe on Him, by grace through faith, we trust Christ. And we're saved, we're born again by faith. But once we have that faith, the Bible says we are to take on this, this challenge of building up ourselves on our most holy faith. The New Testament tells us that we're to add to our faith. And we're to build on top of it. We're to grow, we're to prepare. And if you're going to get into the fight, if you're going to contend and earnestly contend for the faith, it's going to take preparation. It's going to take some repetition. It's going to take some learning. It's going to take some growing. And as the Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, he said to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. He told him to, to, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus as a soldier. He said, And the things that thou hast heard of me, learned of me, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach all, others also. But then he said in the next verse, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. A soldier doesn't go to battle without preparation. They take them to a place called boot camp. How many of you any, in here want to go to mil, in the mil, military? Excuse me, military. Anybody? Maybe I got a half a hand there. Those who go in the military, they first go to boot camp. It's a basic training. They call it. It's a preparation. They don't send them off to war without preparation. They don't send them off to war. They don't send a soldier to war without preparing for war, making sure that they know how to fight in the fight making sure that they're prepared to overcome what they're facing. Look, God has put us in a fight, but there's some preparation that must take place. We have to understand that contending will cost you something. I liked what I think was a Brother Plowman said this morning. Someone asked a preacher, you know, do you have to give anything for this? He said, it didn't cost me anything. It cost me everything. What a statement. This doesn't cost us just anything, by the way, teenagers. It'll cost you everything. Because God is asking us not just to give us part of us. Stop compartmentalizing your Christian life. Stop giving God pieces. Stop giving God parts and say, God, I'll give you half or I'll give you this piece. I'll give you the majority of my life. You know, if you're going to earnestly contend for the faith, you have to count the cost. Jesus said to his, those who were wanting to be his disciples, he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He said, it's going to cost you yourself. You're going to have to lay yourself on an altar. You're going to have to take up your cross. But he said, how, he said what man of you, he said, what man of you preparing to build a building, a tower, would not sit down first and count the cost to see if you have sufficient enough to finish it? He said, lest... When he hath laid the foundation and hath not enough to finish it, others walk by and say, there was a man who started, and I'm paraphrasing, but, but could not finish. You see, if you're going to continue, you've got to be preparing to contend. Contending takes preparation. It's going to cost you. It's going to take courage. Pastor Sexton said this, our position must always be biblical. And our disposition must always be Christ-like. I think that's a great statement. I encourage you to write it down. Our position must always be biblical. Listen, young people, don't be afraid to be, to be biblical in your life. Don't be afraid to stand for the Word of God. Don't be afraid to live according to the Word of God. Listen, we've got some young people who want to be chameleon Christians. You know, we want to look like where we are. You know, when we're at Dollywood... It's easy to blend in. How many of you wore the, uh, the Congress t-shirt? All right, it's not easy to blend in when you're wearing the Congress t-shirt to Dollywood. Um, but sometimes we go to places like that and we just find ourselves, even without being aware of it, blending in and just becoming a chameleon Christian. Look, put yourself in a position where you have to stand for Christ. Put yourself in a position where it's going to take courage and you're prepared. I mean, take gospel tracts with you. Put yourself in a position where you're going to give the gospel, where you have to present yourself in a way that you are worthy of giving the gospel. I'm talking about just contending for the faith. It takes preparation. Let me say this, number four, and we've got to be done. 
Number four, contending is perpetual. Contending is perpetual. It's personal. It's passionate. It takes preparation. But number four, contending is perpetual. It's perpetual. Again, look at the end of verse number three. He says that we earnestly should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. If you wrote down the quote from Pastor Sexton that we began with, I want you to look at it. I'm going to say it again. He said, our faith was once delivered, but it must be contended for in every generation. Listen, young people, it's your turn. It's your turn. If this thing is going to be perpetuated, it's your turn. The reason I'm here today to be able to stand in front of you and speak of the faith that we hold is because someone handed it to me. Someone gave it to me. Someone before me contended for it, fought for it. They went to battle for it. They wrestled for it. They stood up for it. And they handed it to me. And the reason I'm able as a 45-year-old man, to father, to stand and hand it to my children or to stand in front of our youth ministry and hand it to the teenagers, the reason I'm able to do that is because someone handed it to me. And this contending, it can't stop with me. I have to fight for it so that I can hand it to my children and you may get out of contending. You may say, well, I'm not going to be one of those. I'm just going to kind of, I'm just going to kind of float through this thing. I'm just going to kind of wander through this thing aimlessly. I'm just going to allow myself just to see what happens. Que sera, sera. You may say, well, I'll get by without contending. But you won't have anything to contend for in the next generation if you don't decide, number one, that it's personal, that I'm going to be passionate about it, that I'm going to prepare myself to contend, and that I'm going to, perpetuate i'm going to earnestly contend for the faith we have a duty we have a duty as christians you have a duty to contend because of a danger the danger is an enemy that's walking about seeking whom he may devour the devil wants to destroy your faith he wants to devour your faith he's a roaring lion and the day you let up the day you stop contending the, the day you say i'm just going to take it easy a little folding of the hands, a little sleep, a little slumber is the day the devil finds the door cracked open and he seeks to steal and to kill and destroy. Contending must be perpetual. Will you get in the fight? Will you earnestly contend for the faith that was handed to you? It's your turn. Let's continue. Let's continue. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for this faith that has been handed to us. Father, help us to be worthy, worthy soldiers that will contend and fight, that will strive, that will wrestle against the enemy, that will stand for the faith. Help us to continue in the faith and contend for the faith. In this generation and in the generations to come, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen.